Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for attending the session about the uh, Open Source Review Toolkit, uh, which is a fairly new project, so which might explain that you haven't heard about it yet. Before we start, maybe some fun facts about me. So, um, I'm working at a company called Here Technologies. I'm located here in Berlin, which is one of our biggest engineering sites. Um, I'm leading all uh, engineering-related open source efforts that we're doing in the company. I'm uh, still an active open source contributor myself uh, to a variety of, of projects, uh, both privately and, and during my work time. And I have some background in mobile development and computer graphics. My current favorite technologies, if uh, someone cares, uh, include uh, Kotlin uh, as a language, uh, Gradle as a build system, and my all-time favorite is, is Git. So I'm, I'm a total Git evangelist. Two of my hobbies include uh, coding, 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 also in my spare time, and off-road RC car racing. And uh, if you then think of cars like this, then I have to disappoint you. No, my car actually looks like this. So um, I'm, I'm really an engineer still at heart, which also explains why this talk is going to be rather technical. So it, I'm not going to talk so much about um, our internal processes and, and governance in that sense, but more about what the tool actually does, why it does it this way and not another way, what are uh, the problems we are trying to solve, what are our internal requirements towards the tool, and finally, of course, the tool itself, an overview over the different tools in the toolkit, um, and also a bit about CI integration and the roadmap. <coughs> so what is the problem we are trying to solve? Um, well, our company is not really affected with open source governance in the sense that we don't sell uh, consulting or products in that area. So why, why do we even bother? Um, simply to scratch our own itch. So we have the need to review our own products for license compliance, and that includes um, identifying the transitive dependencies, identify possible license incompatibilities incompat uh, between dependencies in the tree, ensure that we follow license obligations, like uh, creating notice files in the end. And all of this is, of course, not necessarily limited to, to FOSS uh, dependencies, right? So uh, the, the way we implement things um, is, is generic in the sense that uh, as long as your metadata is fine, it, of course, works also with um, commercial dependencies that, do, that you might have. <coughs> So if you manage to implement all of this properly, you, you get a bunch of side benefits, which turn out to be, um, yeah, rather valuable. First of all, maybe some of you know, for example, the ThoughtWorks um, technology radar of recommended technologies, like what should you adopt, what should you maybe not look into anymore. And uh, we basically, by scanning all of the dependencies that we use in the company, get a good overview of the tools, languages, and frameworks we're using. Also, we're able to identify, in quotes, problematic components. Maybe there is reoccurring packages that have broken bad metadata, and we find out, hey, all of these broken packages come from the same maintainer. Maybe it's a good idea then to not use anything from that maintainer anymore. Uh, also, using all this data, you um, yeah, you're fa fairly easily able to uh, report secur security vulnerabilities. And uh, to some extent, gathering this data and analyzing your own source code for dependencies also enforces best engineering practices, um, especially with respect to the build system and maintaining dependencies. I'll come to that um, a bit later. <coughs> so, what are our own requirements? Um, we have a bunch of maybe rather unique requirements. One of our key requirements is we must not make any modifications to the projects or to the source code of the projects we analyze. We cannot go to our product teams and say, hey, look, we need to do this open source review uh, or license review on your product, but before we can do that, you need to apply this plugin to your build system. That doesn't work. Um, 
So the only exception then is um, if the build of the product depends on some magic configuration settings, like some secret global configuration that you have to apply in order to even build it or query the build system for dependencies. That's something that we consider a violation against best engineering practices, and this is something we need to ask the team to fix. <coughs> um, we need support for uh, common package managers, so um, like Maven for Java, Gradle, SBT for Scala, NPM, and so on. And we need to be able to capture the metadata, of course, but um, like declared license, etc. Uh, et cetera. But just declaring, or sorry, just relying on the captured metadata and declared license is, is not enough. So statically parsing the package manager definition files like package JSON and so on is not enough because in many cases you have things like version ranges defined in there unless you have a log file. So depending on the time you actually build or install the product, you get different dependencies. Maybe only in a minor version, but we have seen dependencies that in turn ch change their transitive dependencies in, in a big way between minor versions. So not everybody adheres to semantic versioning. <coughs> so what we need is the real version that gets used by the product, including uh, resolution of the version, uh, version conflict resolution, like the build system would do it. So really, the, the real thing. We also need to know where the source code is located in order to scan the source code, because we must not rely on the declared license. Maybe a project says, hey, I'm Apache. But then if you look at the dependencies, you see, hey, it's actually including a GPL dependency. Doesn't well work together. We need to be able to fix up broken metadata. Many open source projects don't really care much about their metadata. They don't de declare a license at all. Maybe they have typos in the SPDX uh, license identifier, something like this. They don't tag their releases in Git. We need a way to fix this, on our side at least. <coughs> and of course, we need to support all kinds of mixed projects, multiple uh, package managers in the same tree. And we want some sort of support for what we call unmanaged projects, like for languages that don't have a dedicated package manager, like plain C, C++ projects, embedded Linux stuff, and so on. <coughs> when it comes to the interchange formats, we want to rely on public standards, like uh, SPDX, also semi or upcoming standards like about code data, because not everything that we want to document is, uh, can be captured in SPDX. Um, we want to be able to use our own scanner. So we, we are not intending to reinvent the wheel here. The toolkit is more the glue between existing tools as far as we think they can be used. And for example, you should be free to use as a scanner for Sology or a scan code, or Amazon recently uh, released a scanner course, uh, called Ascalono. So we are just the wrapper around the scanner and unifying the input and output in that case. <coughs> that also avoids uh, vendor lock-in. <coughs> And then in order to uh, efficiently use the tool in CI, we need fast incremental scans by reusing existing results and, and being able to do delta scans. <coughs> Finally, when it comes to looking at the results, um, we want something that is taking the work off of our legal department in the sense that we have a rules engine, that's how we call it, um, to apply license compliance rules. There, there, so our legal department should be uh, able to give us, f at least for the majority of cases, some, some rules, computable rules, where we can say, okay, if this and that or that block release or uh, whatever block the change to not go in, um, taking into account, uh, of course, things like the scopes of a dependency. So in, in Maven speak, you might have uh, a test dependency and um, usually test code doesn't get shipped. So it's not delivered, it's not distributed. So you probably don't care about it um, at all. <coughs> 
Also, we would like to have multiple result formats, so we need some sort of graphical representation of the dependency tree to get a better overview. Legal people love Excel, so give them Excel. Um, and also things like generating the notice files um, is something that is covered by the reporter tool that I'll talk about soon. Last but not least, all of this should be reasonably easy to set up in CI. And taking all of these requirements together, after some long-running evaluation, we came to the conclusion there is nothing on the market um, that we could buy or use that fulfills all of these needs. So we came up with the Open Source Review Toolkit, or ORT for short, how we call it. And like I said, it's uh, just a suite of tools, um, command line tools in this case, that um, are supposed to be plugged together in the way of working you, you need them. Of course, the tool itself is open source. It's on GitHub already. Uh, it's Apache 2 licensed. It's, it's written in Kotlin. Um, who knows Kotlin, by the way, as a language? Okay, so it's a fairly new language uh, from uh, a company called JetBrains, who are most uh, um, famous for their IDEs, I guess. Um, it's targeting the JVM, so it's uh, fully compatible with um, the Java world, but you could also uh, compile Kotlin to native code to some extent if you wanted to. From a software design perspective, um, the toolkit is composed of libraries, Java libraries, and each of the libraries um, has a small main entry point, so you could use it as a command line tool. And the tool is, in fact, in production use by us for or since no oh, for for six months. Yeah, then, then that's correct. So exactly the version that you see on GitHub, the master branch, is in use by us in production in house. We don't have an internal fork. We don't hide anything. That is exactly what we are using. <coughs> the first piece in the toolkit is the so-called analyzer. Um, if you were following one of the open chain uh, talks or workshops, then this is the tool you would uh, use in the uh, identification step. That's how uh, open chain calls it. Um, as input, the analyzer just takes a local directory with uh, source code and optional curations. Um, that is something I will uh, talk more about uh, in the end. And what it does is it, it gathers all facts, all data, all metadata about software dependencies. And uh, currently, we have uh, 11 supported package managers. <coughs> and the output is, uh, at your choice, a YAML or JSON file with the dependency tree. So that's probably not very readable from far behind, but um, you will get the slides anyway. So this is, uh, in, in, well, in our view, YAML is a good compromise between being human and machine readable. And here you simply get uh, stuff like, uh, what is the name of the dependency? What is the version? Where does it come from? Um, how do versions map to source uh, um, code revisions and, and this kind of stuff? Next in the uh, toolkit is the downloader. The downloader is a tool you would fairly, yeah, or probably n yeah, n never use uh, on its own. It's uh, implicitly used by the scanner, but I will anyway talk about it. So the input for the downloader is the output of the analyzer that, that you just saw, and it's really a pretty much dumb tool, right? It's uh, the only purpose is, like the name says, it, it downloads, it fetches the source code. Um, but it wraps whatever underlying VCS or um, other protocol you're using. So we're supporting Git Mercurial subversion and so on. And the output is simply a local directory with source code. Of course, as this is more or less just a generic download tool, you could also use it to download the source code to be analyzed before running the analyzer. Then there is the scanner. This is what you would use in the open chain audit step. Um, the scanner, like I said, is, is just a wrapper around whatever license slash copyright scanner you have configured it, it to use. So as input, um, it can take the analyzer file directly. Then it does the download internally. And it runs your configured scanner. So we have currently four supported scanners. But our scanner of choice is the Nextco, uh, sorry, 
the scan code scanner from a company called NextB, which is also open source at GitHub and written in Python. Output, again, at your choice, YAML or jo uh, JSON file with the scan results. And the scan results, and that's again probably not very readable from uh, far behind, include, um, for example, the name also of the scanner, the version, and the way you have configured the scanner. So everything that could take an influence on the scan results is captured as part of this result file. And you can also have results from multiple scanners in the same result file. So you can easily compare um, different results from different scanners for the same piece of software. The last uh, tool in the toolkit as it currently is, is the reporter tool. The reporter tool takes as input the scanner file and it generates a custom report or visualization out of it. So like Excel for legal review, like static HTML page for getting a quick overview or the notice files that you would need in case of uh, redistributing uh, your software. Um, now coming to the curations, um, the curations are an optional input to the analyzer and they augment the package's original metadata. So this is how we fix broken metadata in upstream open source projects. This is also again uh, a simple YAML file, key value pairs, uh, fixing up um, metadata entries. And this is something we are, um, where we are collaborating with the Clearly Defined Initiative, which is mainly run by Microsoft and who aims to contribute back uh, fixes of, for metadata to open source projects. So we are basically serving as an input to Clearly Defined. That's the, that's the idea. <coughs> Continuous integration is uh, more or less a trivial topic in this case because the toolkit is comprised of command line tools and it's, it's fairly easy to uh, set this up in Jenkins. In, in our case, we're using a Jenkins multi-job and each job runs uh, a different command line tool uh, from the toolkit and basically the, the YAML uh, input output files are just passed uh, between the jobs. Um, you can either um, trigger the job based on code changes in the product you want to analyze or of course just run it on demand um, like you could also do things like uh, before actually starting to use an open source library, you run the scan on demand on the library and give feedback to the team and say, yes, uh, this should be fine to use. There will be no, no bad surprises in the end of your uh, 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 whatever sprint or shortly before the release uh, with us saying, oh, sorry, you should have asked us before. This contains whatever GPL, you cannot use it. <coughs> Um, and then uh, the way we, we, we use it is also by uh, giving currently some non-blocking feedback in, in the code review tool we are using. Uh, so you get some label, passed, not passed, warning, problem, something like this. So all of this that you've seen so far is already there and working and in production. <coughs> but there are a bunch of more tools we are working on to complete the toolkit. The evaluator will be the tool that is using this rules engine uh, to offload our legal department and with, with the easy cases and uh, give some early feedback before legal people even look at the scan results. So this is our next big topic and we hope that this will be a really cool feature and legal will thank us for um, not wasting their time anymore. The advisor um, is our idea of um, the tool that takes the analyzer's output and reports security vulnerabilities. And then finally, there will be something like the, what we currently call the documenter, could also be part of the, the reporter maybe, um, that is creating uh, or documenting the outcome of the whole review process, in su uh, including legal conclusions uh, and creating uh, BOMS bill of materials in uh, SPDX format with some custom annotations maybe, because currently it's not uh, possible to capture everything in SPDX that we would like to include. 
um, but we're also working with the SPDX tech community to um, yeah, maybe extend the specification or future specifications to include some more uh, metadata. That's about it, um, about the tool, everything that I wanted to say. Um, in case you want to reach out, here is my email address. Um, the, the slides will be shared later on. Um, our organization at, at GitHub is called Here Maps, so there's where you can take a look at the OSS Review Toolkit. Also links to clearly defined initiative and uh, the scan code scanner are included. Okay, thanks for listening. Any questions? <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. So we've seen previously OpenChain and Quartermaster. Mm -hmm. There seems to be certain overlap. Do you plan to merge these projects to switch over, or you just invested already so much that you plan to stay on your own solution? No, the idea is, um, well, first of all, yes, you are right. Um, th there is some overlap, uh, especially between Quartermaster and um, the ORT toolkit. The funny thing is these two tools developed roughly um, at the same time, and we were approaching almost the same problems from two different angles. So Quartermaster is a tiny bit more um, tailored towards analyzing C, C++ pro projects and uh, projects that are uh, built on Linux with, with Make or CMake and that kind of stuff. Um, also Quartermaster, um, watches the build process and, and tries to find out what goes into your binary. So it, it rather looks at the binary and to, to find out what exactly is being distributed, whereas our approach uh, looks at the source code mainly to get a complete picture and then in the end we filter out data um, findings based on scope or also package and file levels um, to, to get to the point where only relevant data is shown. That said, uh, we are in touch with uh, the Quartermaster people and EndoCode, and um, we could, for example, uh, envision a Quartermaster being integrated into the ORT tool to handle all these unmanaged projects. So it would be basically just in our speak or in our view package uh, uh, manager if you want to say so so we for everything that we currently treat as unmanaged we would use quartermaster so that is one way we could work together so you actually don't plan to switch over because well, it, it, it solves over. a different problem well it, it's well quartermaster doesn't solve the problems that we have, uh, whereas our tool currently does fairly well. Uh, it has a few gaps, and uh, we could fill these gaps on our side maybe by, by uh, using Quartermaster, but we will for sure not switch to mm. using Quartermaster. Mm. That's not uh, no, feasible mm. for us currently. Hi. Hi. Um, if I understand correctly, you're starting from the packages, from the binaries, in effect, so you, you're exploring what Gem has created or, or PIP or whatever. Is that right? Yeah, so w what we call package depends a bit on, on the language, right? right. Uh, so sure. um, in case of NPM, it, it would be, uh, well, yeah, a tarball containing the source code, but right. we are still capturing um, the real source code location in terms of Git URL and uh, so on. Okay, so my real question then is how do you assure yourself that what that package is telling you is the truth? Um, well, when it comes to license data, for example? Just in general. Uh, so um, we, we did some work trying to figure this kind of provenance question out um, a few years ago, and at that point we engaged with, say, the Ruby Gems community and said, can we help ensure that the URL that you're saying is in the package is really where it came from? Yeah. And members of the community said, oh, no, we don't care about that. We're sure it's true. Yeah, uh, a good point. So let, let's take the example of uh, NPM again. Um, what we do is 
only if we cannot find the source code in a version control system, we fall back to scanning the source code as it comes with the package. So basically, we, we ignore the package content. We, we take the package metadata and we verify it by going actually to the source code URL mentioned as part of the package metadata and, and, and then checking out the source code and, and scanning the source code, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so we, we do some cross-checks to, to avoid that. So, for example, um, again, NPM taking as an example, um, not in the package JSON file, but in the registry, in the NPM registry, there is for some, but not all packages, to be fair, uh, something called git head. We, we do trust the NPM registry, yes. So, well, yeah, NPM in that uh, case is maybe a, a really bad example uh, because I agree the NPM registry and uh, the way packages are published there is completely broken because you can have things like the SHA-1 pointing to even non-existing commits because the developer never pushed the commit to anywhere, right? So we have cases like this, uh, but at least we detect them because, um, well, <laughs> if we clone the repository and cannot check out the commit, then we clearly know something went wrong. So, and this is also the case where then uh, human labor is uh, asked to create curations, and, and creating these curations is really a uh, forensic effort, right? So sometimes it's, it's really, really hard to find out where does this source code really come from. And in some cases, we simply cannot tell. Sometimes it uh, just disappeared. So where possible, we do some sane cross-checks. Uh, when we run into problems, then we detect them in most cases. But sometimes there really is no fix uh, to the problem. Any more questions? You're evaluating the licenses a second time, so if it just says I'm an MIT, are you comparing it with the original MIT or the Apache, or if the developer made maybe some changes, is there something inside? So in that case, we trust the scanner that we are using. We are trusting scan code from NextB uh, to correctly identify the license text and match it to MIT, for example. So scan code is really basically comparing the paragraphs of the, of the literal license text to MIT, of course, taking into account some modifications and so on, so it's uh, <laughs> way more complicated than just wrapping uh, mm -hmm. through files. Um, but yes, so in that case, we trust the scanner, but this is why you can swap the scanner for anything that mm -hmm. you trust maybe more than, than uh, we would do, or the other way around. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, okay. It does. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Thank you.